Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jared Rand, and welcome to the Global Guided Meditation Call for Saturday, November 12, 2022, 3 p.m. Eastern. Turn within and become liberated, because it's all a dream. Turn within and become liberated, because it's all a dream. Robert Adams. So I invite you to take a small step back from your mind right now and practice witnessing the thoughts passing through it. Imagine that the thoughts you see are like puffy clouds floating through a vast empty sky. And you may notice some of your inner clouds can be quite dark, dense, tense while others are more light, white, and fluffy. Simply witness whatever kinds of cloud formations you're currently having. And notice what the weather report is right now. How would you predict the forecast and future conditions from the weather you're having right now? Now notice how your inner sky, that which provides space for your thoughts, does not discriminate against what types of clouds can or cannot pass through. The sky allows for every type of cloud, thunderstorm, and hurricane to enter with grace into its infinite space. Notice how your inner sky does not grasp onto or push away any particular cloud formation. The sky allows every cloud to remain there as long as it needs to and lets each cloud dissipate whenever it's ready to dissolve and not a moment sooner. The whole sky of your inner being is without thoughts, without clouds. Osho. The sky is amazing. And what I really love about it is its inherent sky-like quality. The sky is always open and receptive. It is always yielding, forgiving, and forever expansive. And the sky has no beginning and no end to it. It is always accepting, welcoming, and making space for whatever wants to enter. The sky does not discriminate, judge, or hold back from anything or anyone. And the sky is connected to an infinite amount of space. It has more than enough space to hold the trillions of planets, stars, galaxies throughout the entire universe. It is the foundation for the existence of the universe. And it will always have enough space for whatever wants to show up and be present. Just like the sky, these are the small qualities of consciousness our essential spiritual nature. Eternity and infinity are inherent qualities of our true essence. Who we truly are is pure consciousness and without any boundary. Our ego, a collection of ideas about ourselves, is full of boundaries and limitations. The clouds cannot exist without a sky to hold them. Everything must have an opposite to exist in this life. Our unlimited eternal nature must exist because the thought exists that says we are limited beings and our physical death is the end of our life. When it comes down to it, there is only pure unlimited consciousness in every direction. The awareness within consciousness is the witness for everything in our lives. Our awareness is limitless, without boundaries, borders, or rules. It is as vast, welcoming, and permissive as the limitless sky about. Look within, see the self. Then there will be an end of the world and its misery from unmoration. It's to be expected that the complex ego mind with all its emotional thunderstorms will get in the way of knowing the vast boundaries, the boundless infinite being we truly are. 
we are designed to lose sight of the truth we are meant to misunderstand and forget our true spiritual nature each time we start to feel limited stressed out by life and lost our building up internal blindness that motivates us to see a brighter clarity of our truth our darkness makes us yearn to find our light. The pain of feeling lost, alone, and without purpose or meaning in life causes us to search for the freedom and happiness of our divine spiritual nature. Within each of us is the light of a thousand suns. The experience of losing sight of our infinite nature is a necessary and mandatory part of our journey through this life. The seeming loss of our sky-like self makes us become even more aware and awake so that we eventually expand beyond all the clouds and into the vast infinite sky above, seeing the bigger picture of it all. The good news is that no matter how dark our clouds may get, we are always connected to the sky. The air that we breathe inside our darkest inner dungeon is still connected with the air of the highest stratosphere above. Air moves freely through us and is always exchanging atoms in between our lungs and the infinite sky above. Look around. Perhaps you might notice that the air around you is not disconnected from the infinite sky above. This next inhalation that we are breathing right now is connected to the infinite sky. The secret to having continuous access to your skylight self is very simple. Just don't take any cloud seriously or personally. Watch and observe them. And notice how each cloud forms out of nothing and dissolves back into nothing. And sure, our thoughts are very entertaining to watch, yet there will never be anything more amazing than the freedom that comes from being as free and infinite as the sky. Nothing is more healing and liberating than this. Deep down inside ourselves, we already know that we are not any of these ideas we were given about ourselves. We are the witnesses to each of these ideas. We know that we are the watchers who are watching these thoughts pass through. We are aware enough to know that we are not these white, happy, puffy, fluffy clouds, or these horrible dark thunderstorms. We know that we are the vast, infinite sky that welcomes it all. However, this life is all about growth, and our soul has come here to learn and evolve. We are here to deepen in knowing our sky-like nature until it has fully become grounded in our breath, in our heartbeats, and every movement of our souls. We all must practice awareness of this knowing until the day comes when it is permanent. We must choose to practice stopping the mind from dwelling on the perpetual spin cyclone of desire. And remember that we are free forever free, like the sky. It is only when we are fully being here now, in this very moment, can we realize that we already are this vast, pure consciousness. We will wake up and remember that we are free. And then we will forget it and fall back asleep a thousand more times. It is our karma 
to experience days where our inner weather patterns accumulate more precipitation and we feel like we feel like life is heavy, dark, overwhelming, and even dismal. Perhaps a deeper part of ourselves is attempting to ignore a massive thunderstorm that's been hanging overhead. The mind likes to hold on to those light, sunshiny days where there are only blue skies, rainbows, and not a cloud to be seen. Remember the sky, your soul, is here to experience everything. It is here to explore all the good and bad dualities of this life. Whatever clouds we are currently clinging to are simply clouds. Our souls have deemed worthy of clinging to. For whatever karmic reason, there is some tension in holding on. So let it be. The deeply eternal loving news is that no matter which type of hazy fog continues to keep clouding up your mind right now, your mind will eventually find freedom from it. Eventually, we can find this freedom at any time by simply stepping back into our infinite sky-like nature. Every storm always passes through eventually in time. Cosmic energy is within and around all of us, recharging the body at all times with vitality. We can call on that eternal supply to make the body fit in every respect. A perfect body, free from dis-ease, presents less resistance to the practices for attaining self-realization. Paramahansa. Yogananda. If we look back at our lives, we will see it. We will notice how every thought storm we've been caught in has at some point passed on by. And sure, we may have been caught in a freezing midnight snowstorm, lost in a dense fog, or trapped in a cyclone of confusion. We may have been in an emotional rainstorm for weeks, months, or perhaps drowning in depression for years. Yet there were always a few moments when the sun poked its rays through. In one moment, it can happen. In a single instant, we can realize that we are not this weather pattern. We can step back from it from it all and glimpse a greater truth perhaps through laughter tears or a sweet deep relaxation we can appreciate our weather pattern and joyfully return to the remembrance that our true nature is always going to be this vast infinite and limitless like the sky No rain, no rainbows. Old Hawaiian saying, no rain, no rainbows. Beautiful rainbows in this life can only happen because of the rain. Yet every time we believe a rainbow is permanent and gas and grass tight onto it, we start living a lie. This lie then tends to formulate a cloud of energy within us. Over many hours, days, and weeks of accumulation, clouds wander into weather patterns and create certain climate behaviors which then dominate our mood, desires, and intentions and make us believe the entire world is this same climate. Weather patterns can become thick and make us temporarily blind from seeing the divine perfection that is everywhere. We get lost in the mind, caught up in the illusions of right and wrong thinking, and miss the true vastness of our infinite, eternal, sky-like being. The storm is here to make us more spiritually expansive, so embrace it, 
and face it. Whatever storm is brewing inside any of us, breathe into it. Allow this awesome, fierce force to make you expand into something even bigger. We have this vast freedom within us already. We can watch our mind obsess about our clouds and then effortlessly let them go. We know whenever we hold on to tightly, we will suffer. It always happens. When you do suffer, just notice why you are choosing this experience. Watch what weather patterns are holding on to. Watch what weather patterns you are holding on to that are causing you to build up tension and hang tight onto these specific clouds packed full of energy. What is that wound inside you that makes you think you deserve a spinning hurricane or a faster cyclone of thought so you feel even more chaos and ungrounded in your life? Just watch your holding pattern. See them for what they are. They happen so that we can one day recognize that we also have the freedom to sit back, relax, and observe the sweet, glorious sunset from the horizon. We have the choice to sit at the highest peak above all the clouds and smile as even the biggest cumulonimbus clouds sweetly float below you. We can just stop and realize that we are already free right now. The eternal world, the external world, is just as much you as anything inside of your skin. You, as a human being, are a symptom of nature. You are not something that comes into the world, but something that comes out of it, Alan Watts. We think we are in a constant state of change, yet the essential you is without change. It is changeless, timeless, and spacious. Everything around, in, and that moves through the sky will change. Yet the sky remains as it is. So watch these weather patterns of yours closely. Keep your attention clear and see what what is it that's holding on to the weather. Be like the sky. Allow every cloud to move through you. Feel into your vast infinite nature. It allows every thought, feeling, and experience to effortlessly pass. Explore this. Pretend that you are the sky. Let these next thoughts and feelings pass on through. Do not cling to a single one. If you do cling, notice where you are clinging why? We must choose to learn from the sky. We must be willing to see what it has to teach us about ourselves. We must be willing to own those thoughts that seem to stick to us and understand why we must see our patterns and observe how they arise and fall away without forgetting we are this vast consciousness and that cannot be enslaved by anything. If every day is an awakening, you will never grow old. You will just keep growing. Awareness is the only thing that will give us back our power. We can let go of this wild, ephemeral world and allow ourselves to experience the vast being we truly are. 
This vastness contains the bliss everyone is looking for, and ironically, it is always available right now. Fortunately, the winds of consciousness naturally will blow each cloud through. We don't have to do anything. The winds of grace will naturally pass every thought through. We truly do not have to do a single thing, but relax into our vastness. If our mind starts to avoid or attach itself to any particular thought form, just notice how some of that particular weather pattern begins to accumulate. As the mind calms and becomes free of thoughts, we experience quiet in our heart and being. Now we are able to truly pray, to commune with our creator. Suzanne Scott. So this coming week, my invitation to you is to relax into your most amazing sky-like self, your soul, your pure consciousness, who can allow every kind of cloud to pass through. Whatever negative ideas you discover that you have about yourself or anyone, give them an infinite amount of space. Notice what clouds tend to build and create those violent lightning bolts of rage. Watch the clouds that create a long, dreary, foggy afternoon or a fast-bursting rainstorm or even a wild, turbulent hurricane. It's amazing when the mind discovers its true vast nature. Everything falls away. And all we are left with is bliss. We are here to discover our infinite divine nature. We are on a journey to access the boundlessness of our being. We are here to drop into our vastness, find total freedom from every type of suffering in this world. The coming of the beloved one is welcome, but the going of the beloved one is wept over. The meeting with the one who is repulsive is a misery, and the departing of a repulsive one is bliss. But if you go on dividing yourself into these polarities, you will be in hell, living in a hell. If you just become a witness to these polarities, then you say, this is a natural phenomenon. It is natural to the body concerned. That is one of the seven bodies. The body exists because of this. Otherwise, it cannot exist. And the moment you become aware of it, you transcend the body. If you transcend the first body, then you become aware of the second. If you transcend your second body, then you become aware of the third. Witnessing is always beyond life and death. The breath coming in and the breath going out are two things. And if you become a witness, then you are neither. Then a third force has come into being. Now you are not the manifestations of prana in the physical body. Now you are the prana, the witness. Now you see that life manifests on the physical level because of this polarity. And if this polarity stops, the physical body will not be there. It cannot exist. It needs tension to exist. This constant tension of coming and going, this constant tension of birth and death, it exists because of this. Every moment, it moves between the two poles. Otherwise, it would not exist. In the second body, 
love and hate is the basic polarity. It is manifested in so many ways. The basic polarity is this liking and disliking. And every moment your liking becomes disliking and your disliking becomes liking. Every moment, moment to moment. But you never see it. When your liking becomes disliking, if you suppress your disliking and continue fooling yourself that you will go on liking the same things always, you are only doubling, fooling yourself. And if you dislike something, you go on disliking it, never allowing yourself to see the momentous and the moment when you have liked it. We suppress our love for our enemies, and we suppress our hatred for our friends. We are suppressing. We allow only one movement, only one pull, but because it comes back again, we are at ease. It returns, so we are at ease. But it is discontinuous. It is never continuous. It never can be. The vital force manifests itself as like a dislike in the second body. But it is just like breath. There is no difference. Influence is the medium here. Air is the medium in the physical body. The second body lives in an atmosphere of influences. It is not simply that someone comes to contact with you and you begin to like them. Even if no one comes in and you are alone in the room, you will be liking, disliking, liking, disliking. It will make no difference. The liking and disliking will go on continuously alternating. It is through this polarity that the etheric body exists. It is its breath. If you become a witness to it, then you can just laugh. Then there is no enemy and no friend. Then you know it is just a natural phenomenon. If you become aware and become a witness to the second body, to the liking and disliking, then you can know the third body. The third body is the astral body. Just like the influences of the etheric body, the astral body has magnetic forces. Its magnetism is its breath. One moment you are powerful, and the next moment you are powerless. One moment you are hopeful, and the next moment you are hopeless. One moment you are confident, and the next moment, you lose all your confidence. It is a coming in of magnetism. To us. And a going out of magnetism from us. There are moments when we can defy even God. And then there are moments when we fear even a shadow. When the magnetic force in us, when it, is in, when it is in us, when it is coming into us, we are great. When it has gone from us, we are just a nobody. And this is changing back and forth, just like day and night. The circle revolves. The wheel revolves. So even a percent, even a person, like Napoleon had his impotent moments. And even a very cowardly person has his moments of bravery. In judo, there's a technique to, have, to know when a person is powerless. That is the moment to attack him. When he is powerful, you are beyond and bound to be defeated. So you have to know the moment when his magnetic power is going out and attack him then. And you should incite him to attack you when your magnetic force is coming in. 
This coming in and going out of the magnetic force corresponds to our breathing, our breathing. That is why when we have to do something difficult, we will hold our breath in, for example. If we are to lift a heavy stone, we cannot pick it up when the breath is going out. We cannot do it. But when the breath is coming in, or when the breath is held in, we can do it. Our breath corresponds to what is happening in the third body, the etheric. So when the breath is going out, unless the person has been trained to fool you, that is the moment when his magnetic force is going out. That is the moment to attack. And this is the secret of Judah. Even a strongest person, a much stronger person than you, can be defeated if you know the secret of when he is fearful and powerless. When the magnetic force is out of him, he is bound to be powerless. The third body, etheric, lives in a magnetic sphere, just like air. There are magnetic forces all around us. We are breathing them in and breathing them out. But if we become aware of this magnetic force that is coming and going, then we are neither powerful nor powerless. We transcend both. Then there is the fourth body, the mental body. Thought pulling in and thought pulling out. But this thought coming in and thought going out has parallels too. When thought comes to you while you breathe in, only in those moments is original thinking born. When we breathe out, those are moments of impotency. No original thought can be born in those moments. In moments when some original thought is there, the breathing will even stop. When an original thought is born, then the breath stops. It is only a corresponding phenomenon. In the outgoing thought, nothing is born. It is simply dead. But if you become aware of thoughts coming in and thoughts going out, then you can know the fifth body. Up to the fourth body, things are not difficult to understand because we have some experience which can become the basis to understand them. Beyond the fourth, things become very strange. But still, something can be understood. And when we transcend the fourth body, we will understand it more. In the fifth body, how to say it. The atmosphere for the fifth body is light. Just as thought, as breath, as magnetic force, as love and hatred are atmospheres for the lower body. For the fifth body, life itself is the atmosphere. So in the fifth, the coming in is a moment of light, and the going out is a moment of death. With the fifth, we become aware that this life is not something that is in us. It comes into us and goes out from us. Life itself is not in us. It simply comes in and goes out just like breath. That is why breath and thought became synonymous because of the fifth body. In the fifth body, the word prana is meaningful. It is life that is coming and life that is going. And that is why the fear of death is constantly following us. We are always aware that death is nearby waiting at the corner. It is always there, waiting. This feeling of death always waiting 
for you. This feeling of insecurity, of death, of darkness, is concerned with the fifth five. It is a very dark feeling, very vague, because we are not completely aware of it. When we come to the fifth five and become aware of it, then we know that life and death both are just breaths to the fifth body, coming in, going out. And when we become aware of this, we know that we cannot die because death is not an inherent phenomenon, nor is life. Both life and death are outward phenomena happening to us. We never have been alive. We never have been dead. We are something that completely transcends both. But this feeling of transcendence can only come when we become aware of the life force and the death force in the body. Freud said somewhere that he somehow, somehow had a glimpse of this. He was not an, ad, an adept in yoga otherwise he would have understood it he called it the will to die and he said every man sometimes is longing for life and sometimes is longing for death there are two opposing wills in men a will to live and a will to die to the western mind it was absolutely absurd how could these contradictory wills exist in one person Freud said that because suicide is possible, there must be a will to die. No animal can commit suicide because no animal can become aware of the fifth body. Animals cannot commit suicide because they cannot become aware. They cannot know that they are alive. To commit suicide, one thing is necessary, to be aware of life. And they are not aware of life. But another thing is also necessary. To commit suicide, you must also be aware of death. Animals cannot commit suicide because animals are not aware of life. But we can commit suicide because we are aware of life, but not aware of death. If one becomes aware of death, then one cannot commit suicide. A Buddha cannot commit suicide because it is unnecessary. It is nonsense. He knows that you cannot really kill yourself. You can only pretend to. Suicide is just a pose because really you are neither alive nor dead. Death is on the fifth plane, in the fifth body. It is a going out of a particular energy and a coming in of a particular energy. We are the ones in which this coming and going happens. If we become identified with the first, we can commit the second. If we become identified with living, and if life becomes impossible, we can say, I will commit suicide. This is the other aspect of our fifth body asserting itself. There is not a single human being who has not thought at some time to commit suicide. Because death is the other side of life. And this other side can become either suicide or or murder. It can become either. If you are obsessed with life, if you are so attached to it that you want to deny death completely, you can kill another. By killing another, you satisfy your death wish that will, the will to die. By this trick, you satisfy it, and you think that now you will not have to die because someone else has died. All those who have committed great murder, Hitler, Mussolini, and still very much afraid of death, they are always in fear of death. So they project this death on others. The person who can kill someone else feels that 
he is more powerful than death. He can kill others. In a magical way, with a magical formula, he thinks that because he can kill, he transcends death. That a, that a thing he can do to others can be done to him. This is a projection of death, but it can come back to you. If you kill so many people, then in the end, you commit suicide. It is the projection coming back to you. In the fifth body, with life and death coming to you, with life coming and going, one cannot be attached to anyone. If you are attached, you are not accepting the polarity in its totality, and you will become ill. Up to the fourth body, it was not so difficult, but to conceive of death and to accept it as another aspect of life is the most difficult act. And to conceive of life and death as parallel, as just the same, as two aspects of one thing, is the most difficult act. But in the fifth, this is the polarity. This is pranic existence in the fifth. With the sixth body, things become even more difficult because the sixth is no longer life. For the sixth body, what to say? After the fifth, the eye drops, the ego drops. There is no ego. You become one with the all. Now, it is not your anything that comes in and goes out because the ego is not. Everything becomes cosmic. And because it becomes cosmic, the polarity takes the form of creation and destruction. That is why it becomes more difficult with the six. The atmosphere is the creative force and the destructive force. In Hindu mythology, they call these forces Brahma and Shiva. Brahma is the deity of creation. Vishnu is the deity of maintenance. And Shiva is the deity of the great death, of destruction or dissolution, where everything goes back to its original source. The sixth body is in that vast sphere of creativity and destructivity. The force of Brahma and the force of Shiva. Every moment the creation comes to you, and every moment everything goes into dissolution. So when a yogi says, I have seen the creation, and I have seen the pralya, the end, I have seen the coming of the world into being, and I have seen the returning of the world into non-being. He is talking about the sixth. The ego is not there. Everything that is coming in and going out is you. You become one with it. A star is being born. It is your birth that is coming. And the star is going out. That is your going out. So they say in Hindu mythology that one creation is one breath of Brahma. Only one breath. It is the cosmic force breathing. When he, Brahma, breathes in, the creation comes into existence. The star is born. Stars come out of chaos. Everything comes into existence. And when his breath goes out, everything goes out. Everything ceases. A star dies. Existence moves into non-existence. That is why that in the sixth body it is very difficult the sixth is not egocentric. It becomes cosmic. And in the sixth body, everything about creation is known. Everything that all of the religions of the world talk about. When one talks about creation, he is talking about the sixth body, the knowledge concerned within it. 
And when one is talking of the great flood, the end, one is talking about the sixth body. With the great flood of the Judeo-Christian or Babylonian mythology or Syrian mythology or with the Kral Leia of the Hindus, there is one outbreath, that of the sixth body. This is cosmic experience, not an individual. This is a cosmic experience. You are not there. The person who is in the sixth body, who has matched the sixth body, will set everything that is dying as his own death. A Mahavira cannot kill an ant, not because of any principle of nonviolence, but because it is his death. Everything that dies is his death. When you become aware of this, of the creation and the destruction, things coming into existence every moment and things going out of existence every moment, the awareness is of the sixth body. Whenever a thing is going out of existence, something else is coming in. A son is dying, another is being born somewhere else. This earth will die eventually and another earth will come. We become attached even in the sixth body. Humanity must not die, but everything that is born must die. Even humanity must die. Hydrogen bombs will be created to destroy it. And the moment we create hydrogen bombs, the very next moment we create a longing to go to another planet. Because the bomb means that the earth is near its death. Before this earth dies, life will begin to evolve somewhere else. The sixth body is the feeling of cosmic creation and destruction. Creation, destruction. The breath coming in, the breath going out. That is why Brahma's breath is you. Brahma is a sixth body personality. You become Brahma in the sixth body. Really, you become aware of both Brahma and Shiva, the two polarities. And Vishnu is beyond the polarity. They form the Trimurti, the Trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh, or Shiva. This Trinity is the Trinity of Witnessing. If you become aware of Brahma and Shiva, the Creator and the Destroyer, if you become aware of those two, then you know the third, which is Vishnu. Vishnu. Vishnu is your reality in the sixth body. This is why Vishnu became the most prominent of the three. Brahma is remembered, but although he is the god of creation, he is worshipped in perhaps only one or two temples. He must be worshipped, but he is not really worshipped. Shiva is worshipped, even more than Vishnu, because we fear death. The worship of him comes out of our fear of death. But hardly anyone worships Brahma, the God of creation, because there is nothing to be fearful of. You can already create it so you are not concerned with Brahma. That is why not a single great temple is dedicated to him. He is the creator. So every temple should be dedicated to him, but it is not. Shiva has the greatest number of worshipers. He is everywhere. Because so many temples were made as a dedication to him. Just a stone is enough to symbolize him. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to create so many idols of him. So just a stone is enough. Just put a stone somewhere and Shiva is there. Because the mind is so fearful of death. You cannot escape from Shiva. He must be worshipped. And he has been worshipped. But Vishnu is the more substantial divinity. That is why Rama is an incarnation of Vishnu. Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu. Every avatar, divine incarnation, is an incarnation of Vishnu. And even Brahma and Shiva worship Vishnu. Brahma may be the creator, but he creates for Vishnu. Shiva may be the destroyer, but he destroys for Vishnu. 
These are the two breaths of Vishnu, the incoming and the outgoing. Brahma is the incoming breath. Shiva is the outgoing one. Vishnu is the reality in the sixth body. In the seventh body, things become even more difficult. Buddha called the seventh body the Nirvanakaya, the body of enlightenment, because the truth, the absolute, is in the seventh body. The seventh body is the last body. So there is not even creation and destruction, but rather being and non-being. In the seventh creation is always of something else. It is not of you. Creation will be of something else, and destruction will be of something else, not of you. While being is of you, and non-being is of you, and the seventh body, being and non-being, existence and non-existence, are the two breaths. So one should not be identified with either. All religions are started by those who have reached the seventh body. And at the end, language can be stretched at the most to two words, being and non-being. Buddha speaks the language of non-being, of the outgoing breath. So he says, nothingness is the reality. Or Shankara speaks the language of being and says that Brahman is the ultimate reality. Shankara uses positive terms because he chooses the incoming breath, and Buddha uses negative terms because he chooses the outgoing breath. But these are the only choices as far as language is concerned. The third choice is the reality, which cannot be said. At the most, we can say absolute being or absolute non-being. This much can be said, because the seventh body is beyond this transcendence, is still possible. I can say something about this room. If I go out, if I transcend this room, and I reach another room, I can recollect this one. I can say something about it. But if I go out of the room I'm in, and I fall into an abyss, then I cannot say anything about even this room. So far with each body, a third point can be caught into words. Symbolized because the body beyond it was there. You could go there and look backwards but only up to the seventh is this possible. Beyond the seventh body, nothing can be said because the seventh is the last body. Beyond it is bodylessness. With the seventh, one has to choose being or non-being, either the language of negation or the language of positivity. And there are only two choices. One is Buddha's choice. He says nothing remains. And the other is Shankara's choice. He says everything remains. In the seventh dimension, in the seventh body, as far as man is concerned, and as far as the world is concerned, life energy manifests into multidimensional realms. Everywhere, wherever life is to be found, the incoming and the outgoing process will be there. Whatever life is, wherever life is, the process will be life cannot exist without this polarity. So prana is energy, cosmic energy. And our first acquaintance with it is in the physical body. It manifests first as breath, and then it goes on manifesting as breath in other forms. Influences, magnetism, thoughts, life, creation, being. It goes on. And if one becomes aware of it, one always transcends it to reach to a third point. The moment we reach this third point, we transcend that body and enter the next body. We enter the second body from the first, and so on. If we go on transcending up to the seventh, there is still a body, but beyond the seventh, there is none. Then you become pure. Then you are not divided. Then there are no more polarity. Then it is advait, not two. Then it is oneness. 
I'll join you in the meditation, and I'll return to close the cell.
take a slow and easy breath in through the nose and a slow and easy breath out through the mouth. Remain still. You will live for eternity. And this body and mind will die someday. Yet you will go on and on and on. Once you know in your heart that you have an infinite amount of time ahead of you, you relax and step into an expansive, timeless, multidimensional spiritual experience. Every little occurrence becomes another opportunity for spiritual growth and enlightenment. So sometime today, act as if you are living an ever useful, energetic, super alive body mind that will live far beyond a thousand years. Have conversations with people from this place knowing you will live forever. Imagine the wisdom, relationships, and life experiences you will have during this time. Feel, experience, and know you live forever in an ideal anti-aging state of being. Explore, imagine, and rediscover who you are. Take this with you for the rest of the day and the evening and night and following morning. We will return here Sunday, November 13th, 2022, 3 p.m. Eastern, to continue our global guided meditation call. Mm-hmm.